Hey guys, it's Reagan. I wanted to let you know that we're still in our series on the essential habits of productive Christians, but I have a special treat for you this week because I'm going to be being joined by a guest. It's Joe Bernard, and if you've been a longtime listener of this podcast, you might recognize that name. He joined me in episode 24 way back in January of 2020. Now, Joe is the perfect guest to have on the podcast to talk to us about Christian habits because he runs cross-training ministries, which helps men develop the basic disciplines they need in their life to walk faithfully with the Lord. I think you're going to like this conversation. I really enjoyed it, and you'll see a lot of uh, intertwining of some of the things we've already talked about on here in regards to scripture memorization, waking up early, and all that kind of stuff. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Redeeming Productivity Show. This is the podcast that helps Christians get more done and get it done like Christians. And I'm your host, Reagan Rose. Well, I'm pleased to be joined this week by Joe Bernard. And if you have been a longtime listener of the podcast, you'll know that I had Joe on a little over a year ago. And Joe is the founder of Cross Training Ministries, and he's also a pastor in Edinburgh, Scotland. He's also the author of The Way Forward, A Roadmap of Spiritual Growth for Men in the 21st Century. And I just love Joe's ministry because he provides hyper practical resources to help Christian men grow spiritually. And that's what we're all about here at Redeeming Productivity, keeping it practical. So Joe, nice to have you. Oh, it's great to be with you again. So, hey, I wanted you to kind of fill in um, some more details from us. I know you just a couple months ago retransplanted back over to Scotland. You're uh, pastoring over there. I know you're passionate about ministering to men. So maybe tell us a little more about yourself. Yeah, so uh, this is my third time in Scotland. Uh, so excited to be back. Uh, those Some listeners may realize this, but, you know, Scotland's got an incredible spiritual heritage, but like most of Western Europe, it's a dark here. This is a post-Christian climate. And so I'm excited to be both at the church scene, but also uh, in just working more broadly, trying to train up men um, and train them into guys that can really thrive within a secular environment and be the kind of spiritual leaders they need to be. So it's great to bring cross-training ministries and be able to do more in a UK setting. What's different about cross-training ministries than are available to um, Christian men in other ways in the church or through seminary? really our target is Christian guys that, that feel stuck, you know, that they have a desire to grow. But, you know, we struggle for a variety of reasons. And sometimes um, there's almost like there's too many options, there's too many possibilities. Or sometimes it's because people are helping us with, you know, a few spiritual disciplines, but they're not helping us with the other 97% of life that gets in the way of those spiritual disciplines. And so what we're trying to do with cross training is uh, give men a more holistic uh, program, something that isn't that intense in the sense that guys that have families, jobs can do, but that really pinpoints those barriers that uh, restrict our growth. And so, yeah, so we try to develop the good habits, but we also try to break some of the bad habits. And I think when those things come together, then all of a sudden you can begin to have a lifestyle focused around discipleship. And that's what that's what we're after. I mean, I don't think there's any shortcuts to spiritual growth. And so what are the things that over time can really bear fruit? Uh, that's what I want to help men with. Yeah, and I, I love that kind of holistic idea of it. Because like you even talk about bodily discipline and like exercise and things like that, which I don't know, like the, a lot of times people traditionally don't think about that as having anything to do with your spirituality. Like why, why do you deal with that stuff too, and not just with like Bible study, prayer, scripture, memory, that kind of stuff? Yeah, you know, I think we just need to realize how connected life is, how connected mind, body, soul are. And so, you know, as men, especially if you think about men, often they, you know, they hide depression, they hide anxiety. You know, sometimes these things can be alleviated through something like exercise. Sometimes they can't, but you don't know which is which unless you begin to do the most basic things. And then you can build on that. And so you know, some men uh, really, you know, maybe even to an extreme uh, prioritize physical fitness. But then there's a lot of guys that begin to feel a whole lot better and begin to feel like they can begin to be disciplined in other areas when they start doing something simple, like just getting up a couple of times a week and going for a jog. And so, you know, if you're going to set a man up or set a Christian up, 
I think you can't just limit your focus to a very narrow sliver of life. Uh, you got to recognize that, um, again, the body's going to feed into other areas of your life. So let's think about stewarding it. It's one of the primary gifts God's given us. And so why not include in discipleship? No, I, I think it makes a ton of sense, a ton of sense. Um, I, I've been doing uh, in this season of the podcast, I've been talking about the essential habits of a productive Christian. So I thought it was apropos to have you on for this because I, I'm of a similar mind on that is there's, there's more to us than just our, you know, when you're doing spiritual disciplines, there's more to you. There's your body, there's your physical health, there's your, even your nutrition. And I think that guys in the past understood this, I, I Christians, you know, I, I'm even, even reading about um, Jonathan Edwards and his resolutions. He had stuff in there about um, his own diet and how he would um, take care to make sure that he was in the best possible state to study God's word and do what he was called to do as, as a minister. And we, we neglect those things to our own detriment. Um, there was even, I, I had someone on, this is a while back, uh, Drew Dick, and he had written a book on self-control and willpower. And one of the things he talked about in there was the idea of keystone habits that you can, there are certain things, there are certain habits once you start doing them, that other habits just naturally follow along with them. And exercise, um, even in like secular research, exercise is one of those keystone habits. And I know I've noticed that myself, like if I am exercising consistently, well, guess what? I'm also in the word consistently. I'm also have more self-control and I'm better able to fight temptation. And so there is like this holistic aspect of the Christian life that does seem to be I don't know, I'm not trying to rag on other programs or other ways that we do things in the church or in seminaries, but it does seem to be missing a lot of times. And we all kind of know that it's needed, but uh, we need sort of a plan for how to get there. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I think, uh, you know, we said about, you know, preparing ourselves for these other roles. Um, you know, we're often with, with cross-training ministries, it, you know, we're playing with that idea of fitness, but not fitness in the sense of, of showing off in the mirror. That's the wrong mindset, but the fitness that, you know, a fireman needs in order to be able to do his job. And, you know, something like um, getting some exercise, you'll be a better dad, you'll be a better husband because you'll have more energy and you'll have more patience. You know, these things are all connected and it's not the only answer, but it's, uh, yeah, to, to uh, limit the puzzle to just having a quiet time and uh, spending some time in prayer. Um, you're kind of setting yourself up for struggles, I think, as yeah. a Christian. I think you're absolutely right. Um, now, you, you had mentioned uh, a little bit ago about the idea of not just learning good habits, but getting rid of, of bad ones and kind of how that goes hand in hand. Maybe you could speak a little bit more to that. Why is it that we can't just add you know, certain spiritual disciplines. We have to have also remove things. I think, I think if we just dissected a pretty typical life of say, whether it's a, a young adult, middle-aged person, 21st century, well, first of all, you've got to pick up their phone and realize there's, there's probably not a, a spiritual person or within their church, some program to help them with that device. And we all know that naturally there's that downward gravity with a lot of our technology. If we don't resist it, we begin to be distracted and waste time and so on. So that's one thing, you know, and then you think at the end of the day, you know, uh, with Netflix or, or Disney plus or whatever, you know, you watch that one episode too many. And so, you know, you're, you're already behind the next day. So you've been distracting yourself all day. Uh, you know, you're staying up later than you should. You can't get up as early as you ought to get, you know, you have been struggling with that exercise. You just begin to compile all of these things. And you don't see the extent to which your lifestyle impedes what are your deeper goals. Um, and so you take this person, and again, it's not that they don't have a desire. It's not like they're apathetic. No, they do want to grow as a Christian. They've just followed the currents or the ruts of uh, the culture around us. And it just sets us up uh, to waste our attention, waste our time, not care for ourselves, not have any sense of healthy limits. Um, and within that environment, if, if you're not being proactive and again, confronting, identifying, taking inventory of the bad habits, you're always gonna struggle with those other uh, more basic disciplines that we know are essential to spiritual growth. 
And it really, you use the word lifestyle a couple of times. It really is a different lifestyle. Like you can't, I don't know, you can't like just do a couple life hacks or make right. a tweak here and there. Like you're, the Christian life is a radical transformation. You're going to be different. And I, I, what I love about the way you approach it is you don't just tackle one small thing, you tackle the lifestyle thing. And you do that at a very practical level um, with, I know you talk a lot about routines, which is interesting to me. I, I just did a course on morning routines because I, I think you and I probably share a similar view on some of these things. Like you, it's not Herculean efforts that lead to your right. maturity as a Christian. It's what you do every day. And then five years down the road, you're a different person, 10 years, 15 years, but getting that locked in into daily habits. So maybe could you talk to us a little bit like how you think about routines as a Christian and, and some of that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think you're so right that uh, if, if you set up these routines that over time, they really bear fruit. And so, you know, something small, something as small as waking up and the first instinct just to check your email or to check, you know, your social media status, whatever it is, we immediately launch our mind, um, you know, down a path, one, remembering the things we didn't get done yesterday. So now we have that pressure. Secondly, you know, we're following some tangent, whatever the, the media has said before us. And often, you know, uh, Christians do that, and then they go and try to spend some time with God. There, that's almost impossible. You know, the mind just cannot do that. And so something as basic as saying, look, okay, I don't check my email until, you know, if I wake up at six, maybe it's seven o'clock. Um, and to have that space, all of a sudden you're freed up. So you have the clarity of mind that you could spend some time in prayer. Um, and that'd be a meaningful engagement with God. And again, over time, we do know you, you wake up and spend that time with God that can bear rich fruit. But it's as simple as what's your first thing? Do you go straight to your phone or do you delay that and do you go uh, say to your Bible first? And I think it's the same in the evening. Um, you know, so, so often, you know, we're sitting again in our, in our bed and, you know, we're scrolling our phone one last time. And, you know, whether it's the kind of envy at looking at other people's, you know, going on in their life or it's just, you know, the, the blue light from the phone, whatever it is, all of a sudden we can't sleep well. And, you know, that feeds other problems. And again, now you're tired and not getting the quality of sleep. That doesn't really sound like it's a spiritual thing. It's hard to map that on the, the traditional grid of discipleship. And yet it's greatly affecting uh, the state of mind, the state of heart of a Christian. And so whether it's morning rituals, evening rituals, things within the day, what I'm so interested in, what are the small things that really can make an impact over time? Start there. and. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, okay, some program, you have to invest two hours, you know, of focused Bible study. That may not be the thing that yields the greatest results in somebody's life. Yeah, it's interesting. I know a lot of people talk about the phone thing, and and I know I, I get onto that subject a lot too, but I heard somebody say once that, you know, if alien anthropologists came and they were observing us and watching, even Christians, they would think that our God was our phone just from the basis of like that is the thing i wake up and i worship at my at my phone and then when i before i go to bed i i spend my evening prayers looking at my feeds like it it really is a level of excess that is it's hard to it's hard to even remember even 10 years ago when it wasn't like that it's just so normal for us now but i know even for myself what time that used to be spent like in the evening reading a, a book, like an actual real book right. is usually spent on my phone now. And that replacement has happened so subtly. So I love your idea of, of coming in and finding, okay, what's, what's, where's the chink in the armor? What's the small thing? What's the one thing I can change that's going to have a domino effect on my habits, on my routines, that's going to lead me more into not doing the bad habits, doing the good habits, and those things that are conducive towards spiritual maturity. I think in one sense, it's exciting though, in that for a lot of Christians, there's a really simple place to begin. Mm -hmm. And if you just begin to exert a little bit of self-control in these areas, it's amazing the freedom that can result from it. And so, for example, another thing uh, in some of our programs is having a threshold. You know, most people don't operate with a sense of, okay, not falling into the uh, ditch of legalism, but 
uh, what is a responsible limit, say, for how much, much video games I play or how much television I watch on a Tuesday night? They, they have that sense maybe with dessert, how much ice cream they could eat. They don't have that with TV. And so it means without any sense of a threshold, you know, one hour turns into three hours. Three hours becomes every night. And it, mm -hmm. you know, if somebody can recognize, okay, you know, an hour, I mean, that's a good amount of time to relax. But beyond that, that's a little bit excessive on a work night. Just having that sense of a limit can be so freeing, it can remove the decision. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, you have this hour that you didn't realize you had because you're not spending two hours, you're only spending one hour. Now I'd like to pause and thank the supporters of this show. Redeeming Productivity is supported by people like you. Sort of like PBS, but way lower quality. So if you're benefiting from these resources and would like to help support the work of creating videos, articles, a weekly newsletter, and this podcast, consider becoming a supporter of Redeeming Productivity on Patreon. It's my mission to create biblically sound resources to help Christians get more done with their lives for God's glory. Patreon supporters make this show possible, and they also receive special perks like early releases of new episodes, access to an exclusive Discord server of like-minded believers, as well as physical goodies like Redeeming Productivity stickers and notebooks. So if you're interested in supporting Redeeming Productivity, head on over to patreon.com slash redeemingprod to learn more. There's also a link in the show notes, as well as information on how to give a one-time gift if that's more your jam. Thanks for your support, and thanks for listening. It's interesting to talk about limits as something that gives you freedom. Yeah. Do you think that, you know, I've noticed in, in church and even in myself, when I'm talking to people about these things, the hesitancy to want to tell people what limits to put on themselves. Do you think that that's a fear of coming across as legalistic or what do you think that is that we're, where we don't even it seems like we're hesitant to even give people even a very broad just guidance and not say that it's sin to do this, but to just give them guidance, say, hey, maybe you should cap it off around X number. I, I definitely agree that fear is there. And I think a lot of it is, uh, yeah, due to the legalism and fearfulness about, you know, making people think that they're going to be righteous because keeping some sort of rule. However, I know I used to feel really embarrassed to sit down at like a you know, at a table and tell some guy, look, for 12 weeks, I want to tell you when to go to bed and when to wake up. But what kept surprising me is when I do it, all of a sudden guys are like, man, finally, I've been waiting for someone to say, you know, be in bed by 1030, because I keep staying up till 1130. And it, you know, keeps messing me up. And so it's not that it's the, it's not the legalistic principle, it's the clarity, what so many people right. want is just okay, don't tell me to go to bed early, just give me a limit. Over time, I can adjust it to my own lifestyle, but I need a place that takes the decision out of the equation at the, at the front end. Um, and so that's, again, a lot of what we're trying to do is let's get the clarity at the front, then over time, put the responsibility back on you so you adjust to what suits your schedule. But from the gate, it's easier just to say, hey, look, for a limited period of time, let's just do this, cut the decision out, you know, break, get out of the rut, and then uh, again, balance things over time. Yeah, that was one of the things that really impressed me. I was looking through like an overview of your program and you're giving people a bedtime and you didn't say like, you didn't tell them here, here's kind of a range. You said, go to bed at this time, wake up at this time. And I just, I think that's so helpful. I work with, with young men, like college and 20 year old, and that's, they're always asking, just tell me what to do. They just want, give me a specific plan. And uh, it doesn't mean, and I know this is not what you're saying. It doesn't mean that that that's the right way, but it's a way, it's a plan, it's a it's a path, and you walk this path, it's gonna put you in the right spot and you can always tweak things later. I think a great example of that, if you look at the success of say CrossFit, you know, over the last however many years, part of what they do is it's, you show up and here's the plan and it's mm -hmm. scaled for you. The thing is, if you do this workout, you're gonna benefit from it. Yeah. And, you know, so often what we do give within churches, even if you do it, it's not enough to yield the result that you're after. And so you always end up disappointed. You know, you do the reading plan and honestly, you've got the same sort of knowledge base as you did before. And so, yeah, how do you provide that clarity saying, here's the path, but give people the motivation of doing it together so they're not alone. 
and then uh, something again, it's not so uh, over demanding that, you know, you have to somehow be a, a 21 year old and have no family to be able to get the time. Something that slots into real life, but still is enough to be a challenge. Because a lot of people, you know, they're signing up for challenges with fitness or diet or all these other things, but it's hard to sometimes find the same sort of thing that just like, okay, yeah, that's something that's actually worth investing uh, energy in spiritually. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just think it makes it makes so much sense, especially nowadays, like we have infinite options. And right. I, this is something I think about and I've written several pieces on the, just the paralysis of analysis that, yeah. you know, you can't go to the to the grocery store and not be confronted with a million decisions about which toothpaste to buy or which type of right. cheese to get. And we live in that world of million options and it feels like freedom but it really just keeps you from from really going anywhere because the default is i'll just keep doing what i always did because i can't endure making all of these decisions all day and so yeah. i like i love the idea of pulling pulling away all the optionality and saying here's a path just follow it just trust me follow it and you'll you'll see how the lord uses this yeah and i think we really have to come to terms with that paralysis you know, in terms of spiritual platforms, because I think, you know, if you're just an ordinary Christian, and if, let's say you're engaged in church, and let's say you follow some online, you know, platform, whether it's Gospel Coalition or Desiring God, something like that, you know, every day it's like, okay, here's something else you could be doing, and here's another reminder of, of this. All of it's good, but there's not at all a sense of a trail, you know, woven through it. Um, totally. It's just kind of everything that you might do in a perfect world. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're the consumer is a bad, bad way of thinking, but if you are that person who's just on the listening end, that's a lot to process. That's a lot to figure out. Mm -hmm. And there's no, you know, if you're talking about a fitness trainer or something, nobody would do that to their clients say, okay, here's everything you might do. Now go home, figure it out. And we'll see you, you know, after you're done. That is such a great observation. You know, I've worked in resource ministries for a while and like, that is it is there are a million options, but what do I do with them? I think also with Christian resources too, the aim of a lot of the articles you read on a lot of these great websites that we all yeah, enjoy really. are to convict you about some area. And you can end up in just a puddle of defeatist mentality if you if all you do is consume those things and you say, okay, well, I'm not doing that. Let's read the next yeah. one. Okay, I'm not doing that. Read the next one. I'm not doing that. And you just you don't know what to do to get out. You know that you know that you're not walking with the Lord as you ought to. You know your life isn't where it needs to be spiritually and otherwise. But how do you get out? Who's going to throw you a rope? Yeah, and I think we, we undervalue motivationally the power of a small win. And I'm not talking about pride. I'm not trying to feed ego. But you know, let's say reading reading books is a part of the Christian life. But how often are you handed? you know, a book that's 300 pages and you're not a reader and, but this is the book that on marriage that everybody talks about. And so again, part of, part, part of the programs we do is it's like, look, if it's, it's gotta be 150 pages or less because I want a guy to be able to read three or four pages a night and then have this amazing feeling like I just finished the book for the first time since high school. Yeah, and awesome. if you begin to do that, you realize I can, I can read or, you know, I can memorize scripture or whatever. And so you know, without, again, falling into that sense of self-confidence, a lot of people are on the other side where it's like, you know, everything I've ever done, I failed at spiritually. And so it's kind of why, why pick up another book or another discipline? It's going to land in the same place. Yeah. Uh, so that sense, you know, you really can make some progress. I think it's really important for Christians. Now, you mentioned scripture memorization. That's part of the program, right? You have some specific scripture memorization things, right? Talk, talk yeah. to me about that. Yeah, so uh, this is the thing that nobody thinks they're good at. Nobody wants to do it, scares everybody. And yet when they're done, it's the thing inevitably that they say that had the biggest impact. Mm. We shouldn't be surprised by that because, I mean, Psalm 1, right? Meditate on God's word. That's what gives us strength. But the reason it's a part of the program is the, the, everything has kind of two purposes in my mind. One is to combat a contemporary weakness. None of us are good at focusing the mind. Uh, technology has not helped. Hmm. So something like memorization, it counteracts that. You've got to focus your mind. But then on the other hand, you've got all the promises of God. And so like for our uh, entry program, CT12, 
uh, over 12 weeks, it's cumulative, mem men memorize Colossians chapter three, verse one to 24. But what that does is one of the things Christians lack is a blueprint of godliness. Mm. You know, they know if you were to ask them, describe for me fitness, they could give you some sort of description or you know, describe for me success in the workplace. And again, they could give you a description. But if you sit down at Christian and say, describe godliness to me, what is a mature Christian? The mind goes blank. Mm -hmm. And so we're asking people to do disciplines without them knowing what they're meant to grow into through these things. And wow. when you have purpose, that kills motivation. Yeah. So with Colossians 3, somebody's given a blueprint. This is what maturity entails. You start with union with Christ. You've got killing sin. You've got Christian mm -hmm. character. You've got Christian relationships. And you've got work ethic all woven together. And so, again, you've got multiple things. You're combating the uh, flightiness of mind. You're, you're tucking God's word in your heart. And then simultaneously, you're getting a blueprint. So all of a sudden, oh, this is what I need to grow into. And it, you know, be true for a woman as it is for a man, but it's just you know for a mature Christian. That's big, yeah. It, scripture memorization, I think, is one of those neglected areas. It's it is uh, one of the essential habits that we should be practicing, but nobody does it. And it probably is. I mean, in large part, it's a mi it's, it's probably a microcosm of some of these other issues where, like you mentioned, distraction, but also like um, just not having a plan. Like, what, what am I going to memorize? Is just starting Genesis one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think this is where what's exciting to me is when you begin to put together a discipleship program that, that yes, encompasses the disciplines, but also the other areas of life. What happens is men, that moment when they would just, you know, scan through ESPN one more time to, you know, check out like what the recruit, recruiting news is. Instead, they've got, I've got to memorize these verses. And so those 10 minutes, suddenly there's something good to be done. And honestly, the device can be redeemed in that it does make it accessible. There's great apps for scripture memory. And so, uh, whereas I tell men, okay, you've got to commit to 15 minutes a day for memory. What happens is they end up filling up these moments elsewhere. And all of a sudden, you know, they're sitting at the waiting for the kid to come out of sports practice. And so I got 10 minutes. Okay. I got to go through my memory verses. And, um, you know, uh, they wouldn't do it if it wasn't the combination of having a set assignment and also a plan with their phone. Man, I love that. I love that. Um, now, talk to us a little bit about motivation, accountability, spiritual friendships. I feel like those things kind of go in in tandem. And I know it's part of uh, your approach to these things. Um, one of the hard parts, even if someone hands you a plan, is... Uh, you know, it's about Bible reading plan, for example, I, I give up after a little while. I know that we know that that's helped when we do it in a group. Um, it's helped even more when we have people who are in our lives that we're close with. So maybe talk a little about that aspect of it and why you emphasize um, spiritual friendships. Yeah, I think we make a mistake as Christians. We, we rely way too much on internal motivation. Um, it's, it's part of life, but really the, the most effective forms of motivation are external. You know, when, when you commit to something and it's public, all of a sudden there's a sense of accountability, which provides a really powerful sense of motivation, as well as when you surround yourself with other people. You know, these are things that aren't reliant just on your own kind of inner resolve. And so that's why, like for uh, the programs we do, I have men sign like a covenant form that's saying cool. that one, they know what's in it, uh, two, that they're going to do their best to, to do the, the disciplines. And that means something to somebody to actually sign their name. Doesn't guarantee they're going to finish, but in those moments where they would slip off really easily, it's like, well, wait a second. No, I've signed up for this. And so if you get that buy-in along with, like you said, friendship, the friendship is what makes the tedious task fun. Yeah. And we know this, you know, with exercise, you go jog by yourself, you know, you just kind of mindlessly wishing it was done. You get three or four friends and go run with them. And all of a sudden you look forward to it in a mm -hmm. different way. Sometimes we, you know, we build that into discipleship, but often we just miss, uh, you know, how important friendship is. And I think one of the great things that a program can provide for friends is a sense of a shared journey. So, mm -hmm. you know, you think of men's discipleship where you sit at Starbucks every week and you don't really know what you're meant to be doing. And you've got yet another book you're supposed to go through and, again, you lose motivation. Whereas if you sign up for like 
to do a half marathon together. It's like, okay, there's the day. Here's what we're doing. Let's do this together. Yeah. And I think that can translate into spiritual activities where you can say to the group of guys, hey, look, let's sign up for a 12-week challenge. Um, let's do it together. And so those guys, they feel like they're on a journey together. They can hold each other accountable, not to just some abstract principles, but hey, this is what we're trying to do. So you've got some teeth on your accountability. And all of that makes, you know, it just builds into the motivation and, and reinforces that inner resolve that's necessary, but probably inadequate in and of itself. So I think all of those layers of motivation are critical. Yeah, I think that sometimes we feel like having external pressure is a bad thing or that it's, it would be it would be better if it came from within. Um, I don't know if you, you've ever encountered this, any pushback from it, but I think that maybe it's because we grow up being told peer pressure is bad, but this sort of holy peer pressure that keeps you on track, I mean, that's, that's God's design, right? I mean, it, it's not that he made us to be lone wolf Christians, right? I mean, that's why he gave us the it's church. What, it's what marriage is, right? I mean, marriage is this external structure that says, no, in public, in front of everybody, I'm going to say, you know, you and me till death do us part. And we all know that, you know, having a ring on the finger and having said vows that in those difficult moments, you hope it, you wish it wasn't necessary, but in difficult moments, that can be really important, you know, to stay committed to one another. And so, you know, all around, if you just look around, there's all kinds of institutions that make use of this. Yeah. And should be told the church does too, you know, somebody's baptized and profess their faith. And, you know, that's meant to be something where, okay, mm -hmm. you've done this publicly, you know, you've committed and we're going to hold you to that. Um, so you, there's always dangers, but sometimes we overestimate the dangers and miss the good that can come from these kind of external commitments and supports. Um, so what's the structure of the program? You have C CT12, it's cross yeah. training. Is that the 12th uh, time you're going through it? Is it cohort based? How does it work exactly? Yeah, so, uh, so CT12, that's the, again, entry program for uh, cross training. Um, Really, it's built around three things, simple routines, bodily discipline, and spiritual friendships are the things that we've been discussing. Um, so some real simple, in terms of the, the simple routines, uh, it's not meant to be time intensive. I tell guys, I want 15 minutes of scripture memory, 15 minutes where you read, go to church on Sunday, and then there's a plan to help, help uh, with some prayer. So again, simplicity is meant to be part of this. I want it to be something that you can print out on a business card and hand the whole program to somebody and it all be right there. Um, so, you know, it's got that, it's got the, some of the bodily discipline things that we've talked about, and then groups of guys doing it together. So it's definitely not meant to be something where an individual just signs up. Um, sometimes there are groups on Zoom with guys in different areas. Sometimes it's uh, men who are in the same location. But really the, the goal is, this is meant to be a simple thing. I mean, I tell every man that signs up, you can go replicate this. By the time you've memorized this, you've read a book, you don't need a seminary degree. This is something that you can pass on easily. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so in person and together is the way it's meant to be. I got you. So if you had, so if someone's listening to this, it's it's for men only, or it's geared towards men, right? Um, geared toward men, but there, there actually have been groups of women. It's not, it's not so much the content uh, it's just the fact that cross training ministries is built around men's discipleship. Gotcha. So there have been women, female groups that have done it too. So if someone's listening to this, maybe they have a small group or they have a they have a men's breakfast thing. They get together every Tuesday at six a.m. at Panera Bread, and they got the coffee subscription, and uh, they're looking for what to do next. This, this is the type of thing they they might be able to do together, right? It gives them a, a goal and a plan instead of just going through one more new book. Definitely, definitely. Uh, you know, it's not it's not the sort of thing that works with like an entire men's ministry within a church because not yeah. everybody's going to want to sign up to something like this. But you know, where you yeah, where you have a small kind of cohort of guys that are just like ah, we, we need something more. Um, it's perfect for that that type of need. And the idea is, you know, twelve weeks is twelve weeks, so it's not like you're going to revolutionize your life. Honestly, a lot of the things that you're going to try to do, you're probably going to do okay some weeks and not as well other weeks. So the idea is actually that it's 12 weeks that lead into a, a longer uh, leg of the journey. So that the same tracks that have been laid. So by the time you're at the end of it, guys have realized, oh, I can memorize two verses a week. Well, 
let's keep going with that then. So the next leg, guys do the old topical memory system. You know, mm -hmm. 60 great verses that have served a lot of Christians well over uh, the last many That's decades. That's the uh, navigators. The old navigators. Yeah, yeah great stuff. Uh, same thing. So you've read a couple of short books. So let's keep doing it. Let's build competence in key areas. And so there's a short list that focuses on uh, just areas that need to be fleshed out in people's thinking. Um, again, short books. So the idea is that actually you begin to build these habits, break these habits, but recognize by the end, okay, we got to keep going. And so there's, there's a further leg uh, for those that finish the first 12 weeks. That's really cool. Yeah. So it's not just, it's not just the, the 12 week program. You've got more on the other end of it. That's if, right. if guys want to do that, that is really cool. I love what you're doing, Joe. How, how can people find out more if they want to sign up, they want to get into this, how can they get more information? Yeah, for uh, general information about cross training, uh, you can check out the website, xtrainingministries.com. Um, I'd encourage guys to get a copy of my book, uh, The Way Forward. Uh, very much tries to diagnose the problem, why men struggle uh, to grow right now, but then also offers not an ultimate solution, but hey, here's what you see in men's lives who are growing, and then some practical steps on how to get there. So you can check out that book, but then for CT12, this program we've been talking about, if you go to menneedhelp.org, you can see the overview of the program, uh, get in touch with me. I'd love to, uh, love to chat with anybody who wants to try to start a group, wherever they are. That's awesome. And I will include links to all that stuff in the show notes and the description for this. So you guys can click through each of those things. The book, by the way, I've read the book and it's very good. <laughs> Just a little plug for that. Um, the Way Forward, really, really excellent. If, if you've read books on uh, on Christian discipleship growing, that sort of stuff, um, this is this is a, it's a, it's a, it's a different take on it. It's a different approach. And I really appreciate it. And that's one of the, uh, one of the things I really appreciate your ministry. You, you really get down to the nitty gritty. You see, you've seen what's lacking a lot of men's ministries. And instead of complaining about it, you went and you've developed something that's genuinely helpful, a genuine roadmap for spiritual growth for men. And just appreciate you, Joe. I love what you're doing and encourage you guys to check out his resources, check out Men Need Help and uh, consider signing up for that. Great, great chat with you. Thank you. Same here. Appreciate you coming on. We'll talk with you soon.